Welcome to episode 93. Where's my fire? Fire. Fire. This is coming out a little late because, well, uh, I've been very busy traveling. And before we get to anything, a little travel tip, termites. A lot of people don't know this, but I flew into Kansas City and I had, I'm a wizard at Avis. I don't want to throw that down like that, but just bragging. I'm a wizard. Uh. Wizard Madigan. I have my own card. But if you prepay for a reservation, this is gonna this summer is gonna be completely whacked with travel, and the prices are getting crazy. And I'm looking at all of it. I don't know how people are affording it. I mean, I mean, the, I'm flew Southwest, yeah. Nashville, Kansas City, and I'm in line. There, there's families of six. I know what the ticket costs. I don't know where the money's coming from. But as long as we all keep paying it, they're gonna keep charging it. Anyway, fine. Let's say you get there. <laughs> if you rented a car, um, there were about forty people in line. Eight, when I got there. And I'm a wizard, so I'm special. Uh, but I prepaid, but the prepay costs you more, but you're guaranteed a car. If you just make a reservation, normal people don't know this shit, that if you just make a reservation, they're not guaranteeing you a car. What? Well, there are about 40 people in the Avis line that were not going to get a car. Or you're going to stand there until someone else brings a car back. No, it's like a restaurant that overbooked. Sorry. Wow. I know. And then one lady was like, well, I think Avis should bring a bus to take all of us to the softball tournament. I'm like, lady, they only had a, <laughs> one bus to bring you here. Right. And this bus took <laughs> the Kansas City airport. It, it's a wonderful airport if you don't have any luggage and you just get dropped off. Right. But if you got a deal waiting on their buses and they just say they're short on help like everywhere else. But those, that's all a travel t- tip termites. If you really need your car, prepay. Costs a little bit more. Well, if it's not a leisure activity and you don't care when you get a car, but who does that when you fly somewhere if you want a car? Right. You need a car. I'm I'm just seeing things out there on the road where I'm like, boy, oh, 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 these people <laughs> don't know. And my parents wouldn't know. I don't even think my siblings would know that you should do that. Happy summer. You just think, well, I made a reservation, there'll be a car. Right. And Well, no, no. not necessarily. <laughs> no. Um, so anyway, um well, the weekend was so great because I got to meet Sean Cassidy, and I have they have a poster. They're mailing it. They because the lady who runs the theater, Jane, is so nice, and she's like, "Oh, I have a poster uh, advertising you and Sean." And I'm like, "Awesome! Can I see it?" She's like, "They're not here yet." I'm like, "Oh, wah, wah. well, she's gonna send one." But I went over in the day, which I never do. You I never. I always go an hour before the show, an hour and a half before the show to do sound check, and my sound check literally takes five seconds. I walk up and go, "Hello, turn it up, thanks," and then I leave. <laughs> <laughs> but since he's the music guy, we had to work around all that. But I went over in the day, and he was standing there, and I, I, I remained calm. I did not, <laughs> I did not behave Good. like a lunatic. And then talked to him for a while. He knew a bunch of comedians, like he knows Gary. He knew Gary Shanling, and he knows comedians I know. So that was fun. It was a very easy to talk to him. Very, very nice human being. His whole crew of people, and there, his son was selling merch. And I walked by his son, and I'm like. Oh, that's the guy I fell in love with when I was like 12. But now I'm like a pervert. <laughs> like he, he looks just sure. like him. The, the yeah. blonde shaggy hair and all yeah. that. Um, everybody on his in his group was super nice and normal. Uh, it's cute because he doesn't really know the road the way the road is now because uh-huh. he said, this is pretty cool. He said, I was 19 years old and I played the Astrodome in Houston. Uh-huh. 59,000 people showed up. 59,000 girls. I went in St. Louis. Me and my younger sister went to the Checker Dome to see him. And he described exactly what I saw. The concert, he he was like behind a paper. It looked like a giant blue paper plate silhouette. You saw a silhouette and then he had to jump through. But he said in certain towns they didn't test the thickness. And he only weighed like 130 or so. So he would just boy young, just bounce off it. And he was like, shit, that thing isn't done right. But he said, I was 19 years old and there were 59,000 people. And I said, thank you, good night. And I never went back till right now. Wow. So that's 40 years wow. he hasn't been on the road. He's been writing shows, directing things. His resume is impeccable. Oh. He knew my friend Amy Aquino, the actress, the lady on um, Bosch. She plays Lieutenant. I forget. Billets. Billets, right. <coughs> my friend Drew's wife, Amy. Anyway, so we had enough to talk about, so it didn't seem like I was a weird, weird stalker. And I'm sure he's used to anybody my age being like, oh, my God. Now, I said I did have I did have his posters over all over my wall. I didn't tell him that I also had a Planet of the Apes trash can because I think that might have made him feel like lowered a little bit. It was a tough call. I had Fonzie on a motorcycle. I had Sean. 
a lot of Sean, and yeah. then my Planet of the Apes dress code. Did you get a, did you get a t-shirt? I got a sweatshirt that looks like Aviator Nation, and it says, to do Ron Ron on the back, and it says Sean. Oh, he know. offered to give it to me. I refused to allow that. Like, that's the, I go, is that your tour bus in the Walmart parking lot with the merch truck? And he's like, merch truck? He was like an alien, like... <laughs> What is this you would speak of as in a... Mar he goes, no, I'm just relearning all that. Like, uh -huh. But then he comes out and he does it. I did my time. Crowd was great. Um, and they were into the comedy too. Sometimes if they're just there for the music, they don't really care about the comedy. But they were totally into it. And then he did his show and he did sing all of the songs you would know. But he also sang some Broadway things uh -huh. that I think for some of the drift junky 50-somethings, they were like, what? Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, I thought it was fascinating. And then I'm going to put a link in the thing. He can really sing his ass off. He wasn't just a teen idol. Him and David, his brother, did a show, I guess, on Broadway called Blood Brothers. And they went on Regis and... Who's the guy that talks like this? That's Regis. Philbin. Regis, Regis Phil... Re, well, whatever it was called at the yeah. time, that show. Regis and Kathy. <laughs> right, Regis and Kathy. And they sang... We'll put a link in the show notes, also known as the show notes, so you can watch it on YouTube. It's fascinating. I sent it to Lewis. He was like, I'll be damned. I didn't I didn't know either one of them could actually sing. I'm like, they both can sing. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So that was a super fun night. Salina, Kansas. Uh, I went to Spangles. There's a fast food restaurant in Kansas, 27 locations called Spangles, and they're and now they've added cocktails. So you can go in. <laughs> now the cocktail list is questionable. They did for breakfast, I just wanted to taste it. They had a screwdriver um slushy. But the girl was like, I'm going to give you the grande just because I can. I go, okay. Well, I mean, it wasn't a thing. Like, you can't drive after that. I'm like, no, I, I can't drink at all. And then the it's guy, yeah. But it's always fun to go to Spangles if you're ever in Kansas. I made a video. I forgot to post it, but I will. I'll post it. We'll post it today. Yeah, we'll post it today. Yeah. Well, I have other things to post today, too. And then backstage, um, well, then I went to the Ozarks um, and played in the golf Father's Day two-day golf tournament with my dad. And my sister and then my brother and sister-in-law and their kid were the other team, teams of three. Uh -huh. But here's the greatest news. Okay. My brother thinks he's so great. Well, he kind of is. But they had specialties for the over 80 crowd. So my dad was oh. teeing off basically halfway to the hole. And I'm like, yes, we're going to smoke his ass. Did you win? No. Uh, no, we oh. came in third in C flight, which isn't even. Well, they put you in a flight by your handicap. Mm -hmm. And... We're not, Patrick's like a two or something, and I'm like 16, and people don't understand golf. None of this even makes sense, so I'll skip it. But um, you have fun. I had a great time, yeah. I saw the video of your dad. Yeah, the video. He had a blast. He just loved it. But the 6.30 tea time was to originally accommodate my brother, mm -hmm. who wanted to golf as early as possible. And at first, I was very crabby about this situation. <laughs> I'm like, really? I got to get up at 4.45? Because it's like a half hour from where we're at. In the Ozarks, and uh, but it got so hot, I was kind of happy with the six thirty tea time. Oh, nice. Probably didn't wake up till around the seventh hole. Right. I forgot coffee. Yeah, I just got in the cart. I was asleep. I forgot right. my hat. I had to go in and buy a hat. And then I walked around with the stickers on the inside. Didn't even know it. If you wanted to look on Instagram, there's a picture of my hat. It's twenty nine ninety nine, which I think <laughs> I do love the Eldon Golf Country Club, but I think that was a little pricey for that. Just like. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so We're happy Father's Day to everybody. Hmm? We're getting hats. Mm. Yep. We're getting pubcast hats. Yeah. I'm telling you, battles. you do not know what a pain in the ass hats I are. Bet, I think the termites might want. The termites very much might want. Trucker hat? Yeah. Okay. Very we'll see. I'm excited. I think a beer mug, a cold pint glass would have gone further. Oh, They're hard to mail, too, though. Well, no, I don't mail them out. I make the, those people. I pay those people to do that. But I used to do it on my own, and it got insane way back, like 20 years ago. Um, but backstage in Salina, this lady brought me these adorable flowers. I gave them to my mom, which is why I do not have them, because I, they wouldn't make it the whole time till I got oh, back. Right. Yeah, and it came in a little trailer, like a little um, RV deal. Nice. Adorable. Yes, my mom was like, super excited. And then these guys sent backstage. Um, that was from Donna. And... Uh, yeah, it made me happy and my mom happy. Um, uh, this is from Uncle David and Nephew Jacob. They came from Branson all the way to Salina, Kansas. Wow. Yeah, it's not that far, but it's far enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I'd drive that far to see myself 
Um, they brought me beer, the Irish Red War Beard, which I drank most of them before I got here, and then my brother may have drank some. Um, it's delicious, but that's from Kansas. Yeah, and then Art, Arts and Mary's Thick and Crunchy Original Home Size Tater Chips. I ate them. They're good. They don't, I mean, they're what you would think. Nothing. It's a really good potato chip. I don't really understand, though. Where are they made? Like, I like this tater chips. Kansas. Cheney, Kansas. Arts Arts and Mary's. Arts and Mary's. That's confusing. It should be Art and Mary's. Tater what are we? Chips. Well, and then this lady, I forgot to say, Anne from Platteville, Wisconsin, sent a shitload of cheese. It's all down in the fridge. I didn't bring it up. I'm so excited. That's awesome. Good now on the 4th of July. Yep. Boom. It's already done. I don't have to worry about what am I going to bring or who's coming over here or whatever. Um, this is the old school, before we get to it. Wishbone. I haven't had wishbone in forever. Oh, yeah. I know. But it was new. It was sticking out in the grocery store shelf. Champagne vinaigrette. Let's see what the yeah. old people. It is old people stuff. There's one grocery store in my house that's mostly old people because it's small. And they have a lot of old people things in there. But I also enjoy seeing the old people things because I'm basically them. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. It's tangy. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not sure. That's an eye roll. Yeah. It's good. But a little bit of that will go a very, very long way. Oh, my wow. gosh. You like it? Wow. Well, I would say for old people who think they can't taste stuff or People who lost their <laughs> sense of taste during COVID. Um, yeah, get that. That'll wake your ass up. Um, whew. I don't know. Maybe if you put it over like a cold pasta salad, that's what you would do with it. What? You put it over cold pasta. Come on. I'm serious. It's like my summer spaghetti salad. Yeah. It's my favorite thing of summer. That would be good on it, too. I'll make it and do a video. Everybody should have the... Um, it's probably not just the Midwest, but in my mind, it's Midwest because I never see it outside of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. If I would have brought that to some party in California, <laughs> I, oh my God, they would have just looked at me like, yeah, we don't eat that anymore. I'm like, well, <laughs> we do. General. The people, the rest of us do. So thank you. And thank you to the guys who drove from Branson. Now let's get after it. Oh, hang on. Hang on what am I trying now? Yeah. Wheat Thin Ranch. Ranch Wheat Thins. Ranch Wheat Thins. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Sometimes they try to shove ranch in too many things. You can never say that. You can't really taste it. What? I don't taste ranch. What do you taste? Chemicals. <laughs> I taste chemicals. That's probably the idea. No. Kind of tastes like cardboard. Oh, okay, so. Well, I'm not the biggest wheat thin person anyway, but. Uh, here's a little flyer. This is for the theater in Salina, Kansas. Now, mind you, there's not much out there. But guess who's coming to that theater? Crazy people. I mean, awesome. Besides me and Sean. Bonnie Raitt's coming. Oh Amos God. Lee. Dwight Yoakam. Joe Satriani. Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Uh, that's just a few that I know. There's others that I don't know. So if you're bored and you're in Kansas City or Topeka or Wichita... Get your oh, and stopped at the ho the home of the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, I never watched the whole Wizard of Oz. I'm sure I've said this on this podcast because it scared the shit out of me, and I I wanted it turned off immediately, especially when you live in a place where that shit can happen. Right. I mean, a tornado could come and suck me in my bed. To from Missouri, I could end up in Indiana, mm -hmm. Illinois, Kentucky. I don't need to see that. Well, when I land there, it's going to be like this fucked up dream, and there's witches and no. But I understand the premise. I've seen enough of the cultural stuff about it so when you're on your way to salina you can get off in this town when me go and they have the most wizard of oz stuff in this museum uh -huh. which was super cool i got a very cool t-shirt and then across the street the yellow brick road but their yellow brick road it needs to end somewhere fun like <laughs> at like at a bar where you go see that was all fucked up dream right. here's your beer right. like some maybe a wine tasting thing something where does it end up I don't know, just in the back of a courtyard type thing. Yeah, there was something back there about friendship. Something. 
I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I would say <laughs> uh, if you're uh, on your way, get off the highway. It's only like 10 minutes off the highway. Cool. And then I asked the girl who was very informative at the museum, was this really the town? They were like, well, they never really had it in script, but then this guy bought this building, and then he bought some stuff, and then they kind of took it. They just claimed it. Oh, Pretty wow. smart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Why not? <laughs> Updating our queen news. Where is Dolly? Dolly again gave a million dollars to pediatric infectious disease research. Oh, my God. Yeah. How about more of this? How about less of Elon, more Dolly? Uh, Elon's Ken? Elon's not bad. Let's, not Elon is bad. Let, and after we've Googled the term asshole, he fits. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he's a genius, whatever. I get it. But that doesn't mean, you know, whatever. He's really mad at the children for not going back to work. (laughs) (laughs) They're not going to go. You're an idiot to fight that fight. Um, Million dollars uh, to Vanderbilt in Nashville. Um, She said, I love all children. No child should ever have to suffer. I'm willing to do my part to keep as many of them as healthy and safe as possible. Her latest donation will help researchers understand how viruses and bacteria cause disease, understanding and preventing antibiotic resistance, preventing and treating infections, diagnosing and treating infections in children with cancer, and gauging the impact of the childhood infection throughout the world. Wow. We're deeply honored by Dolly's contribution to our research mission. For over 40 years, our division has been a national and international leader in studies for diagnosis, treatment, prevention, da, 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 said the p- fancy person at Vanderbilt. <laughs> so that's it. That's what we're looking for. Good things. Uh, people with money doing good things, helping the other queens. In case you're wondering, Shaka's out on the road. I Googled it. She'll be coming to Columbia, Missouri for the Roots and Boots Festival. Shaka. Are you going? I don't think I can. I think it's a Friday. I think I'm working. But Tanya's also doing it. Tanya's out on the road. Shaka's out on the road. Where's Tanya? Oh, right there. Um, Shaka is on the road. Cher's just tweeting Stranger Things. <laughs> and who's, oh, Stevie Ohm. It's her last show, yeah. No, she was doing indie. She just did Bonnaroo. She did Bonnaroo Sunday night. Sunday night, and it was only 100 degrees. And I thought, oh, my God, if she walked out there in all those witch layers, uh-huh. she could just actually die. Yeah. You could just watch somebody yeah, die. Well, maybe they have air-conditioned fans blowing at them. I thought about that. Like the comedy tent at Bonnaroo, I have performed in that. Really, I just wanted to see my name on the poster, and I got it. (laughs) Well, the comedy tent at Bonnaroo, I don't even know if they still have it. I'd have to ask. This was like five years ago. Wasn't that long ago. It it says air-conditioned. It's not. It's just a giant tent with giant fans. So there's hot air just blowing. But it is shade, which is valuable. But... We were lucky enough to have the bus. No, I don't have a bus, but everybody else has a bus that was backstage. So we could go and lose bus and there's air conditioning and there's ham sandwiches and to hang out all day because we went around and watched all the shows and as much as we could. Um, And I guess Stevie can go from the bus to stage, but like the comedy thing, they say that's air conditioning. It's hotter. It's the only time in my life I've ever gone on stage in shorts and a t-shirt. Yeah, it was that hot yeah. that I'm going to let the world see my day glow white legs. They are so day glow. And I'm like, God, well, I wish I had that fake tanning shit right now. Like, I never put that on either. But I was so hot. So all, congratulations to all the kids who got to go to um, Bonnaroo. Because then I read, <coughs> I was getting alerts on my phone in Kansas for Tennessee. And it was a, a thunderstorm, lightning. They closed the entrances. Oh, no. But then it turns the whole thing into a mud pit. Because me and Dorfman were down there one year when it happened like that. So you're so grateful for the rain because you're so hot. It was extraordinarily hot, like 100. It should be like 85 in June in Tennessee and Missouri, and it's not. It's 150. The The Nashville one, it should say like 85. <coughs> it's oh, Sorry, I'm choking on something. Um, the, the emoji for the weather bug had a cactus in it. I'm like, what, what? the fuck's going on here? It's Tennessee. There's no cactus. Right. That's how hot. And then it just says very, very hot. So I don't know if all the children made it through all the heat and Stevie, but Stevie only had one show left after that in Indianapolis, and then she's done for now. For now. Yep, the Dixie Chicks were in Indianapolis and only did 30 minutes and had to bail because Natalie's voice sucked. 
Which it hurt or yeah. I don't know. She's sick. Allergies. <sighs> Probably. Yeah. I feel like I got completely destroyed by allergies this weekend. Yeah. And when you wake up at four forty-five, you don't know. What to I'm do. sneezing <laughs> and coughing, and my dad's like, "Didn't you take a Claritin?" <laughs> you know, I don't know what the fuck I took at four forty-five, <laughs> Dad. I was dark. I'm wandering around looking for shoes. Like, I'm lucky I have socks and shoes on. Right. And underwear that are the right color with white shorts. God. Okay, that's what's up with the ladies out on the road. And update! <coughs> you know how I say it. When we take these um, yachts from the Russians, yes. <laughs> I'm just obsessed with the whole situation. Yeah. Where do we park them? Right. Who's going to pay for it? You can't, I said, put it at the party cove and make it a bar and dance, and then you get the children to work. Maybe the ones that I'm going to tell you about more children that are quitting their jobs oh, <laughs> as a group. <laughs> Maybe they would enjoy that job. But where do you park it? I was saying a slip to rent in the Ozarks or Tennessee on Old Hickory Lake, they go anywhere from 300 to, you know, 1,000, but 300 for a normal size ski boat, whatever, 25 foot boat. <coughs> but this is 384 feet. Wow. Where do you park it? Well, I know now. Party Cove. No. A Russian-owned super yacht seized by the United States arrived in Honolulu Harbor on Thursday night flying the American flag. Oh. That's right, bitches. Yeah. But here's the thing. You, we can be as proud as we want. You got to find a parking spot. And they went, all right, I got to take a drink of water. <coughs> well, <coughs> God. Gotcha. Yeah, it is that wheat then. It's cardboard. I've never voluntarily bought those. Well, I did it for because I do the work of the Lord. Right. I spent the six dollars for that experiment. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> so they thought, well, I guess you got to think of where's there a lot of water, and they picked Hawaii. The, la the U.S. last week won a legal battle in Fiji to take the three hundred twenty-five million dollar vessel and immediately sail it to Hawaii. The FBI has linked Russian. Oligarch Suleiman Karamov, the U.S. said Karamov secretly bought the Cayman Island flag vessel last year through various shelled companies. Okay. Yeah, well, they all do. They said an FBI search in Fiji turned. Like <laughs> I know, turned up emails showing that the uh, the that his children were aboard this ship this year. Yeah, and they used the um the crew used the code names G O for Karamov and G One for his wife. It has a football field, a live, a live lobster tank, a hand painted piano, and a swimming pool and a large helipad. What? But now, see, here's okay. Here's what we're. Here's what I'm thinking as a boat owner. Okay, you parked it in Hawaii. How much did the bumpers cost? Or does it did it? it I mean, it probably has its own bumpers, but you're gonna need bumpers on your dock to hold this thing, and you need giant ropes. Giant ass ropes. I know how much ro ropes cost at Modern Marine or West Marine or wherever Bass Pro Shop. They're not cheap. See, I mean, we're getting. It's almost worth sinking it. It's the size of Hawaii. Oh, yeah. Well, if it's parked in Hawaii, why not make it a nightclub right there? Exactly. Make some money. Mm -hmm. Got to clean it every day anyway, mm -hmm. right? Or sail it over to Ukraine and give it to the refugees. Yeah. Yeah. Sail it back to the Ukraine, give it to the refugees, and let them. Party like rock stars yeah. if they feel like it. They yeah. probably don't feel like Turn partying. Like a, school. a school? Yeah. All right. That's a good idea, I guess. Speak, but here's one guy that's uh, saying the same shit I am. This is another update. <laughs> Speaking moments before an event at the Center for the New American Security Thursday, Jake Sullivan, who is the National Security Advisor to Joe Biden, mentioned the ongoing Operation Klepto Capture, a Justice Department-led effort targeting Russian elites, proxies, and oligarchs with sanctions and civil and criminal asset seizures. He appeared to be referencing the seizure of the Amida, a 348-foot yacht owned by, this is him, Suleiman Karimov. The U.S. moved it, uh, moved, they moved to seize it in May, and they sailed it, um for the U.S. in early June. We know where it went now. He said, I just wasn't aware how many super uh, yachts there are in the world. I mean, the, the size of these things, the value. But then he started complaining, we have to take care of them. 
Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Totally. The upkeep. You have to have a live crew on these things 24-7. Mm-hmm. Security as well. Because what if I decide to get on there and hotwire that thing like Ruthie and Ozars, and then I just take <laughs> off? I know I know how to drive forward. Oh, I don't yeah. think I could park it. <laughs> and now they have joysticks on the big ones where you can just like a video game, and the boat will go sideways. Wow. He said, "I know it's ridiculous, but you know what the craziest thing is? When we seize one, we have to pay for upkeep." Finally, but see, he didn't think his mic was on. <gasps> yeah, he's saying this on the down low, like. Yeah, the federal government pays for upkeep because they're under the kind of forfeiture rubric. So, like, some of the people are basically being paid to maintain Russian super yachts on behalf of the United States government. The audio of their exchange was broadcast on live stream, which was taken offline as soon as his comments were made public. <laughs> yeah, he's not wrong. Or are we going to keep them? I mean, let's get a committee together and make a plan. What are we doing? How many more are there? Oh, my God. Probably 20 more. No, no. Yeah. And they're all going off GPS. We won't be able to find them. Yeah, that. they all figured out to turn their shit off. <laughs> Took them a while. How dumb are you? Even my mom and dad would know. Jack, the location's on. <laughs> all right, this is an update about the chimp in oh, the Ozarks. The Missouri, chimp. the Missouri chimp. Because I don't feel like I did. Well, I did some, and I still have to call my friend who will really give me the skinny. I didn't have time last week because it's Sean Cassidy and my dad. But, <laughs> yeah, it's a very busy weekend. Sean Cassidy. Uh, from my work. <laughs> Tanya Haddix. It, it's, it's easy to confuse this because Tanya is a lady. Tonka is the chimp. Tonka. And let's not forget how dangerous chimps can be. Let's not forget Travis the chimp in Connecticut or somewhere up on the East Coast that ripped that lady's face off. When they snap, they go big. And they're 50 times stronger than a man. Yeah. Tanya Haddix is facing possible federal prosecution for her elaborate story about Tonka the chimp. She claimed the chimpanzee was dead when really she had it locked in her basement. She offered no apologies in a comment to Fox 2 News. I watched the story. You can watch the video. Yeah, it's real sad because Tonka was not happy in this situation. Haddix interviewed, intervened in a lawsuit years ago in which animal rights group PETA set, sued a Festus Missouri chimpanzee compound. So Festus Missouri is not by the Lake of the Ozarks. Festus is outside of St. Louis. And who knew? Well, I do know we have lax animal laws, laws, I've been told by my friend who had some. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, she doesn't have any anymore, but she did. She moved from Michigan to Missouri just for that reason. What? Yeah. Because I said, I won't say her name because she might have wanted me to. But, uh, she, I said, you have a Michigan accent. It's a really strong, mm-hmm. easily identifiable, Petoskey, Michigan. Oh, <laughs> Kathleen. Like, it's very. And I go, well, how would you end up in Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri? She goes, well, I moved down for the lax animal law. The lax exotic animal laws. I said, what kind of exotic animals? Oh, oh I had everything. Lions, tigers, chimps, all of it. That's how she knew the people from, um, what was the Tiger one? King. Tiger King, right. Anyway, um, PETA was suing the Festus, Missouri. There were a bunch of chimps at this one place, to hoping to get them better home. Now, Haddox could face prison time for claiming one of the chimps was dead so it wouldn't be taken. She clearly had a favorite. <clears throat> Today, Tonka the Chimp is stretching out his new home in Florida with the organization called Save the Chimps. Tonka is an old movie star, having appeared in movies in 1997 comedy Buddy. Never saw it. For the last years, he's been in the middle of a fort, fort, uh, court battle, the federal court battle that led to his strange disappearance. She said that Tonka was dead. He'd been living with six other chimps in Festus. The animal group said that they were not getting proper care. They, PETA arranged for all the chimps to go to Florida to a sanctuary, except Tonka was missing. She told a federal judge he died, so she's now lied to a federal judge. Oh. Mm-mm-mm. She repeated her claim to Fox after hearing, after the hearing, saying, I found him in the cage. It was probably Saturday night. I found him Sunday when I went down there. We followed up with questions. So you stand by the assertion Tonka is dead? Yes. I will gladly give PETA a piece of their ashes or some ashes so they can DNA test that too to make sure they know it's a chimpanzee and not Tonka's bloodline or Tonka that's in the box. 
I offered to give them the ashes, but they told me I couldn't bring them to the federal courthouse because of some kind of cross-contamination or some kind of stuff. <laughs> Tonka was found 11 months later in a cage in Haddox's Lake of the Ozarks home basement. Whoa. Oh, my God. I think about my brother back in the day having to go door to door as a financial advisor to try to get clients. And if he would have been like invited into this house yeah. and there's a full bone fucking chimp in a cage. <laughs> hey, um, the fa- so I don't know who found Tonka okay. living, not dead. A still. At, well, right. Yeah. Um, the judge said the case, uh, the, the federal judge on the case has now made a criminal reference to federal prosecutors for perjury. An offense that can bring up five years if convicted. She said she's unable to talk on camera anymore, Tanya. I stand by my promise to Tonka that I would do anything to protect him from the evil clutches of PETA and the hellhole they placed him in. And if the judicial system was just, he would have never left the only home he's ever known. Okay, you can argue that maybe um, he was okay in Festus. I don't know. But she had him in the basement in a tiny, tiny cage. Like he couldn't even run around. They showed him Florida, and he's outside. He can go inside, outside, a giant facility. Looks very happy. <coughs> Peter said the pictures tell the real story. You, you can compare the basement cage where Tonka was hiding for about a year to the Florida sanctuary where he can be inside or outside, and he can see other chimps. <laughs> so I'll That's keep you updated. Oh well, she she's not a big woman. She's a normal sized lady, and you're dealing with a chimp all by yourself. Like, yeah. I don't know. Maybe she has help. I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> I, I don't know. Update! <laughs> McDonald's and Russia's picks it, picked its new name. Oh, Ready? Mm-hmm. It's called Tasty, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the laziest creative meeting. Yeah. So, Kathleen, what do you think we should call the new McDonald's? <laughs> um, how about Tasty? And they go, that's it? And I go, tasty, and that's it. And then the meeting's <laughs> over. Tasty, and that's it. Uh, yeah. They're going to re- reopen 250 branches by the end of June. And all the branches by the end of summer. Tasty, and that's it. That's terrible. Yeah. And there's another update for McDonald's, since we're on the subject. McDonald's new ed- menu item looks like a McFailure. Oh, it's my brother about Brooks Kep guy, Pat, the golf. Ma- uh, while McDonald's, get McDonald's Corporation, is not t- typically known for its off-the-wall innovations in a fast food space, it is known for dishing up long-standing classic. Take the Big Mac, for instance. Doesn't seem terribly revolutionary to stuff an extra piece of bread in the middle of a burger today, but it would debut in 1967. Wow. What? I'm, I'm older than Big Macs. 67? Mm-hmm. It was so iconic, it even spawned a nickname as a point of currency comparison, the Big Mac Index. For stocks and stuff, yep. Wow. Um, but then the movie Cir- Su- Super Size Me targeted its practices. I thought that movie was kind of bullshit. Yeah. Nobody's going to eat it every day. Not three times a day. Not three times a day. Not even probably, well, Warren Buffett does every day. He has an Egg McMuffin. I and, would. and then he gets the potatoes on the side if the stock market's doing well. <laughs> He's going to eat potatoes for a while. Um, uh, Burger King did the Impossible Whopper, so then... See, I would never, if I'm going to splurge and go fast food, I'm going to get what I want. That, that's not where I'm going to try to be healthy. Some people don't want, don't eat meat. Some people don't eat meat. Well, they have fish. Some people don't eat fish. Meat or fish? Yeah. Well, they have salads. Vegetarian. Well, maybe they want a burger. Well, don't expect you to they're new. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on this, your is, team. It's all good. this is where I would quit the meeting. What? What? <laughs> what? Our whole thing is hamburgers, assholes. What do you mean? There's other restaurants for those people. Those people, that, the healthy people. <laughs> McDonald's began testing it, its own offering. I never heard of this. Here's why I'm not ordering. It was, it was a, quote, burger called the McPlant. It was created in partnership with Beyond Meat. It's all that stuff. I have tasted all of them. I'm willing to try. It all tastes mealy. Yeah. You can't even cook them well done. You say extra well done, it comes out like medium, falling apart. It tastes like, ah, 
what's that shit my mom likes in the morning sometimes? It's, oh, scrapple. it's scrapple. Dog food. Yeah, I mean, scrapple. What's the southern version? Grits. I like them, but you got to dump, like, all the butter and sugar you can find in the neighborhood. Uh-huh. And salt. Uh-huh. Not sugar. Salt and butter. It's just ridiculous. But anyway, it started with initial tests across eight locations. Here's where you could have bought a McPlant. Carrollton, Texas, Cedar Falls, Iowa, Jenning and Lake Charles, Louisiana. I don't see Louisiana. Louisiana. Are you kidding? No. They're down there sucking heads off crawfish at the boil. Their yeah. Health isn't real. El Segundo and Manhattan Beach. I could see Manhattan Beach, California going for it. Uh-huh. It did well enough to expand the phase to 200 restaurants. That's where it suffered with more rural areas like East Texas, which all, all, often only sold three or four a day. The McPlant formed better on the whole in big cities like San Francisco, but it didn't meet initial sales goals. Well, they're not going to get your McPlant people. If you want, if you want to. <laughs> McPlant. McPlant. Well, there's got to be a better name. Totally, yeah. the, the laziness of these creative mo- meetings is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, you just took Mick, which was low-hanging fruit, to call it Mick anything. Or maybe they have to. I don't know. Mick's got to be in it. Mick healthy. That's better than Mick plant. I don't want to eat a plant. No, it's not. It's not. Update. I have an update on Anna. Anna Sorkin, Anna Davi. She's going to mint her. She's going to be minting 2,000 NFTs, and it's going to help reinvent herself. <laughs> If you're curious, she's still sitting in ice in a deportation center. She also, somebody must have not told Anna, nobody's doing the NFT things anymore. We're already over that. We went through it. Some suckers bought them. Even I, like Bitcoin is sucking right now. But I'm in for the ride. And it's been a very fun ride. And if all the money I put in disappeared, I made sure it was hardly any, not enough money that I would care if it disappeared. It's like going gambling for the weekend. Oh, well, what is your amount that you're comfortable losing? But did you have fun on the ride? This has been a great ride. Wow. And people that say, well, it's all a Ponzi scheme. I know. <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm good with that. I just, it's your job to figure out when to get out. Right. And I don't want to get out. I'm in it for the long haul. Either the long haul, we make tons of money. But this is how I gamble too, which is not really that smart. No. Either we're going to win big or we're going to lose it all and say, fuck it. Right now, Bitcoin and Ethereum, we're on our way to... Fuck it. We're on our way to lost it all. But okay. Um, so Anna, she thinks um, somebody bought her website while she was in uh, jail. She used to own Anna.com, AnnaDovey.com. But then somebody bought it, and they're trying to sell it back to her for $50,000. Somebody, there's about three Ron Whites. And they, the one, one guy's like a public speaker about something, but, but it's not my Ron White. No. So Ryan goes, fine, I don't care. I'm not paying anybody for Ron White. Just put tatersalad.com. <laughs> so if you Google tater salad, his picture comes up. <laughs> and potato salad. Um, she's going to make NFTs. Oh, yeah. She's going to make 2,000 of them. You have to register early to get a card to be able to buy one. See what I mean? She's all a racket. She's all a racket, yeah. But if you want to, you go to... um. You know, Google it, and you can go and get yourself an NFT. I'm, I'm waiting for a judge to send her back to Germany. I sent her all the way back to Russia. Let's start where this really started. Russian con lady. <laughs> Update! <laughs> all right, so I told you guys I would try to figure out what the teal swan lady, the spiritual, quote, guru, and alleged Arcturian alien teal swan, because she follows me <laughs> on Instagram, which is so bizarre. Uh-huh. And then I think, does she... I am the polar opposite of this lady, but maybe she wants secretly to be more fun yeah. instead of so serious. And then I watched the show. I still didn't really understand the end game. The end game I'm, cle- I'm getting clearer on because I went and researched it all. It's somebody said, oh, it's just money, but I wanted to make sure. Is that really what we want here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because on the website, this was okay. So if you want to go see her in person, she's got a road schedule. Oh yeah. And they're in these ballrooms and hotels and stuff. You can pay. The cheap seats start at 99 bucks. Okay. The meet and greet up front seats are $1,550. Wow. But I thought it says Los Angeles, California, right? Uh-huh. So I clicked on where. Right. 
Well, they don't tell you where till after you bought your ticket. No. Well, that is not okay in Los Angeles. No. That is okay in Omaha. Right. That is okay kind of in St. Louis or right. Kansas City. But L.A., you could be living in L.A. County mm-hmm. and be an hour and a half away from wherever this fucking hotel is. Like, but if she's your spiritual guide. But why aren't they telling me where it is? Because why can't I do? My website says exactly where it's going to be. Security? Security? Yeah. She thinks she's fancy? No, she does Well, she has 1.2 million followers on YouTube. It's way more than me. 600,000 on Instagram. Way more than me. 700,000 on TikTok. I'm rounding these off. She's published five books of nonfiction and one novel. She hosts speaking, speaking engagements all across the world, such as her synchronization workshops, where for $99 you can connect yourself on a deep level and expand out of your comfort zones towards new horizons. <laughs> um, she also has curveball retreats in Costa Rica, curveball. where she'll... That's what it's called. Huh. Curveball. 5000 bucks for the week. Wow. Yep. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. She'll personally show you the truth about yourself and your life. See, if I went to the curveball one in Costa Rica, I wouldn't be able to concentrate on anything because Ron went to a thing in Costa Rica, and he told me, all you hear is holler monkeys. And then I'd be obsessed with try, trying to see the monkeys in the trees. This is where my disconnect comes in my ADD I'd be like oh really what I really need to do is get more and connect with oh my god there's a monkey (laughs) Ron goes did you know there's really such thing as a holler monkey I said well yeah he goes I didn't know that they were actually real and they're loud he goes even the other monkeys hate them the other monkeys are just screaming shut the fuck up all night long (laughs) it's so loud I was like oh I didn't know all that um she will also bully you if you challenge her or ask her questions she doesn't want to answer. She sells meditations and e-courses online, as well as a t- shit ton of merch, much of it featuring her objectively visual offensive frequency paintings. I, yeah, I there was a paragraph written, it might have been in a different article, where... Um, Hold on. Uh, a lot of people are upset because she kind of talks about suicide like it's like kind of an okay choice, right? Uh, she says she she believes she's the smartest person in the world and a medical savant who can see you your food digesting through your skin. She identifies as a multi-dimensional Arcturian alien. She grew up in Utah, and she had some special gifts at a young age and claims to have spent 13 years in a satanic cult but somehow allegedly spent those same years working as a highly successful international runway model in locations such as Fiji, Milan, although no evidence exists. She's a narcissist. Here's this one, too. Yeah, there's a lot of narcissism going on here. She claims her childhood mentor, who she describes as a sociopath with multiple personalities, sewed her into a a human corpse for 12 hours. I can't even go on. Yeah, it's it's just. I know. It's just a show on TV. I cannot stop joking. I hate wheat thins. God, I'd, I'd rather eat this table if I could. I never understood. I mean, with a piece of cheese, they're all right. But, all right, we're moving on to holy shit, they found it. Chicken fries are back. Long lost Renaissance masterpiece found hanging in 90 year old's bedroom. What? what? Yep. Decades after it was last seen, the 16th century masterpiece, The Depiction of Madonna and Child by a follower of Filipino Lippi, I don't know who that is, shows Mary with the baby Jesus flanked by two angels. The incredible artwork went under the hammer last month at Dawson's auction, selling for a staggering $310,000. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. Somebody named Tyrell... Um, found the painting in the woman's empty house in London after being to after being asked to appraise the contents of the house. The woman had been moved somewhere else because she had dementia. Oh, he's from the Antiques Road Show. Oh. Yeah. She, uh, oh, wait. Oh, it's a she. Said she was flabbergasted after walking into the room and spotting the oil paint in a gi- gilt wood frame. I don't know what a gilt wood, gilt wood frame is. 
She'd been moved. The lady had been moved. In a video, she said, I was amazed to see the 16th century religious painting, something you don't often see on typical valuation. So it was just flabbergasting. She explained how the woman came to the artwork. The 90-year-old had left Italy in her youth, and when her father died, she inherited the painting, and it had been under her ownership for thir over 30 years. Wow. Most of the contents were relatively low value, so I went into her bedroom and was utterly shocked when I saw this painting above her. It literally glowed with quality. Yeah, it's great. Wow, awesome. Yeah, just when you think. But see, yeah. nobody knows that artist. I mean, it's still a great painting. Yeah. We'll put it in the show notes. The picture's awesome. <laughs> but I also think there were so many people painting like that back then. You know, how do we, how do we, I don't know. Holy shit, they found it. This is going to be the COVID thing years from now. Lots of years from now. Ground zero for the Black Death finally found after 600 years. Now we know who to blame. Mm -hmm. That's always what we're looking for. Just a finger to point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alabama. <laughs> Not Alabama. Uh, okay. um, <laughs> the origins of the deadly Black Death have been discovered more than 600 years after it entered the human population. The medieval bubonic plague was the first recorded in was first recorded in the 14th century and was the start of a 500-year-long wave of killer diseases termed the Second Plague Pandemic. Wow, let's not... Whoa! Oh, God. God. It's my sister, Kate. So loud. Yeah, it is loud, I know. Um, the Black Death was ki killed millions, was considered one of the largest infect infectious disease uh, catastrophes in human history. Despite the years of research, the geographic and chronological origin of the disease remained a mystery. The team from Scotland's University of such and such and the University of something, something, doesn't even matter. They took skeletons discovered in a cemetery named near Lake Isaac Cool in the Tian Shan region of Kyrgyzstan. Am I saying that right? Kyrgyzstan. 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 Okay. It's in the stands by Afghanistan. Found in the stands. They were drawn to the site after identifying a huge spike in the number of burials there in 1338 to 1339. The team found the cemeteries, which had already been excavated in the 1880s, with about 30 skeletons taken from the grave. They were able to trace them and analyze DNA taken from the tent, taken from the teeth of seven individuals. Yeah. yeah, so that's where it started. So it's not Alabama. It's definitely not <laughs> Alabama. Yeah. Um, the origins have been debated for centuries by historians. Um, ever since it appeared in, the, in Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa 675 years ago. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, found the DNA, they found in the DNA um, bacterium uh, uh, of it, so they know. But I don't know that you can still say you for sure you know that's where they started, but at least they think they do, and they're smarter than me, so I'm going to take their word for it Science. and say that they did. Yep. Right. Now, this is not a oh, holy shit they found it, but it's news. Moving on to news, um, and it's kind of crazy. It's been about 100,000 years since the last of the woolly mammoths made their mark in North America, but researchers recently spotted one of the remnants of these extinct beasts. Along the shoreline of Alaska's Koyukuk River, a group of professors from the University of Virginia spotted a massive tusk sticking out of the riverbank. I've oh. seen the picture. It's enormous. The group is on a mission to measure the impact of climate change, as part of the University Sanctuary Lab project, which now measures how the how the warming planet affects sanctuary sites, but they were greeted by a marker of an entirely different era of the planet's history instead. Um, Adrian so and so, who was on the trip, managed to capture a picture of the man with us and posted it on Twitter. You can almost touch the. <laughs> when she uses a word I can't do. Sound it out. <laughs> I can't. Or make it Chinese uh, like you. She's referencing the geological period when the woolly mammoths thrived. <laughs> you can Google that yourself. Um, the, tusk has, the tusk has been exposed for the past year or two by the result of the ongoing erosion of the, of the land around the riverbank. So it's been sticking out. So it's not a holy shit they found it, but they've tied ropes and stuff to keep it. But they're afraid the erosion is just going to go away. I don't know why they don't go dig it out now. What's the problem? Getting something else? Like what? The whole mammoth? You yeah. think it's going to be alive in there? <laughs> Eat their little boat? No. Come on now. This is crazy. I read this story and went, just when you think, you know, 
con men and bullshit artists and the Anna Delvies and the, the Teal Swans, whomever these people running around basically gathering money um, for no reason. Grifting money. Grifting. Mm-hmm. The mid- there was a medieval woman who made a living pretending to be Joan of Arc. What? <laughs> what? I swear this is so what crazy. First of all, Joan of Arc is the only person who the Catholic Church condemned and made a saint. Oh. Only person. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. It didn't take long after Joan was executed in May of 1431 for the rumors to start, although plenty of witnesses watched as she was burned at the stake in the marketplace in Rouen, France. Joan's status as a revered military and religious figure seemingly encouraged people to believe that she hadn't actually died. Joan's executioners anticipated this. After her body was burned, they raked back the coals to prove she was dead. Then they set the remains aflame twice more. Finally, they threw the charred result in the Seine, the River Seine, to prevent relics from being collected. But in a, count, in a country grieving a national heroine, the idea that Joan had escaped death persisted. At first, a story circulated among the populace that someone else had been burned in her place. Come on. I mean, we didn't even have the internet back then. No. <laughs> and there's, no. A, there's Q people already on this. <laughs> you know, I heard uh, that there was an imposter and they burnt this girl that they found somewhere outside of Paris and she was an orphan. And so they just burned her instead. Yeah. Um, Others said it was Joan in the flames, but that she'd been spared by God and escaped. Within a few years, women began to appear around France pretending to be Joan, or at the very least acting as if they were inspired by her. They claimed prophecies and visions visions and collected gifts and attention, though in most cases their ruse didn't last that long. By far, the most famous and successful was a woman whose real name was Claude de Amoise. Her ploy lasted four years. Oh, my God. <laughs> It earned her a great deal of cash and almost ensnared the king of France himself. Claude is said to have begun her career in deception by posing as a male soldier in Pope Eugene the Fourth's army, where she killed two men in fighting around 1435 during a rebellion in Rome. The next year, she started laying the groundwork for her Joan of Arc scheme. She began with the real Joan's family. Talk about the balls out to do this. Yeah. She In May... 1436, she met with Joan's brother, Pierre and Jean, and convinced them that she was their departed sister. Okay. Okay. Wow. <laughs> there are so many things I could... <laughs> if somebody rocked in here and said they were my, one of my brothers, there's so many things I could say that only we would know. Like, yeah. Or at least she got them to publicly agree to the idea. That's what I think happened. I yeah. think they went, yeah, well, you're good. Go, how much are you going to give us a third? What, what's our percentage if we go? Claude is said to have strongly resembled Joan, and it's possible the men were blinded enough by grief to think that Claude was really their kin. No. No. As the 19th century French writer Anatoly France described the scenario, they believed because they wished to believe, but other scholars noted that the brothers may also have agreed to, to deceit because they knew there was money to be made. Yeah. She did her research, too. She cut her hair short, for, for frequently wore men's clothes, like the real Joan. Yeah, and people get mad when people do it today. You know? Why does that girl have a guy's haircut? What do you care? And Joan of Arc did it. Shut up. <laughs> she always spoke in Christian parables, which lent a mystical, legendary quality <coughs> to her image. She also effectively clouded facts. After all, you wouldn't want to disturb a poetic holy antidote by asking for clarification. <coughs> no, you would not. All of this worked. Mm-hmm. When the brothers of Joan of Arc um, brought their so-called sister to meet some noblemen, the men were impressed, and they provided her with a horse and a hooded cloak and a sword. Oh, a free sword. <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a horse? Fuck, yeah, that'd be great. Um, the 19th century French historian Jules Kishara noted that there, she rode the horse expertly, lending even more cre- credence to her story. Not, not that any... Not just any peasant girl could ride a horse while Joan had relied on hers during battle. The group then visited towns across northwest France collecting horses and jewels along the way. Jewels. Upon arriving in Arlon, the party was deluged with more gifts by the Duchess of Luxembourg. And the, gr- and the group set up camp for them. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, in this way, her and her supposed sibling traveled around the continent, living the good life at other people's expense during the summer of 4- 1436. 
Princess Elizabeth de Luxembourg and Duchess Elizabeth von Gorlitz, in particular, were great benefactors of the three. Well, Conte, somebody, the count, I don't know. Oh, he fell, somebody fell in love with her. He even made her the head of a military unit he sent to Cologne to provide support for a candidate, the whatever. Here's where things went bad, though. Okay. We're almost to the end. Uh, the 15th century Dominican friar, um, Jean, Johan, Johan Neider, described her activities. There was a woman who from time to time took on the behavior of a male and who's running around uh, armed with wildly flowing clothes as soldiers in the pay of noblemen do. What's worse is she also let herself be seen dancing with men. And she used to drink and carouse. In other words, her behavior was beginning to attract the wrong kind of attention. <laughs> it didn't help that she performed minor feats of magic. What? what? Now you're a Vegas act? <laughs> Tearing a large cloth and then making a hole again or smashing a glass against the wall. Somehow restoring it into one piece. Oh, yeah. An inquisitor in Cologne suspected witchcraft. You can't do magic back then, especially if you're a chick. You're automatically a witch. Now you're, gonna, now you're really going to get burned at the stake. Joan got burned. Now you're going to get burned. Um, and they began uh, an investigation and sent men to fetch her. But she escaped with the help of Comte somebody. Um, the Inquisitor responded by excommunicating her for witchcraft, wearing men's clothes and supporting the wrong candidate for the bishop something. Um, then she went to France. This is where it went bad. Um, hold on. Hold on. The net was starting to close in. A few months after a lavish dinner in Orleans, uh, Claude was finally called to meet King Charles the Seventh himself. So not King Charles the Seventh, not Mean Henry. The French king had heard about this alleged Joan, but he was suspicious, so he decided to set up a test for her. At the palace, Claude was met by a man claiming to be the king while the real Charles watched from afar. But Claude knew, perhaps from royal gossip, that the real king wore a soft boot on his ulcerated leg, Ugh! which this man did not. So she called his bluff, going to the true king and said, Charles was astounded. Saluting her, he said, you're welcome back in the name of God. Who knows that the secret is between us? After this, Claude fell to her knees. She knew that she didn't know the king's secret and confessed to being an imposter. We don't know what the secret was, except it was a reference to a, a clandestine sign that Joan of Arc and Char Charles shared when they first met in, in 1429, and it had to do with his legitimacy to the throne. Yeah. Well, this is what happens when you don't have cable. Right. I mean, people do crazy things. Um, yeah. She was exposed at last, but she and Joan's brothers weren't punished for their lies. Instead, Claude was sent back to her husband in Jelani to live out the rest of her life. Yeah. Four years she got away with it. Wow. Somebody who was burned in public at the stake. Yeah. Nope. I'm back. I did it. It's me. Mm. <laughs> um, I might save this one. Okay, there's, this is a giant, very hard article. And I'm not going to read it. But for you people who have seen my act, I do jokes about armadillos on the march. Mm -hmm. it all, when I was a child... Armadillos were in Mexico in cartoons, and then they were in Texas, and then they're in Oklahoma. Now they're in Missouri. They're in Tennessee. They keep going because they used to not be able to survive a winter in somewhere like Oklahoma or Missouri. Even northern Texas, they couldn't. Dallas, it gets cold. It was freezing rain. Well, now they're everywhere. I'm going to put the link to this article if you want to read it. Okay. it. Like when people say, like, I don't know exactly. I don't know science what's ca causing global warming, wow. but we have... South American animals just walking them down Highway 70 in Missouri. Yes. And no one's, like, alarmed. And when they, they must have a shit ton of babies. I didn't read it because they're everywhere. Uh -huh. It's not just you see one once in a while. It's <laughs> now a thing. More than raccoons, roadkill. Way more than raccoons, more than hardly anything. Sure. Everything. Um, listen to this shit. <laughs> this is crazy. Okay. Geico which I had for a while because I love the lizard. Yeah. Yeah, and then I had to switch because too many things or something or something with the house or I don't know. <laughs> or? I don't remember why. Mm -hmm. Geico ordered. I liked them, though, and I never had a problem with them. Like, I would go back to Geico, but it's something Mike Patrick set up for all the house and all that. Geico ordered to pay a Missouri woman $5.2 million after she contracted an STD in a car. 
What did you just say? You heard me. A Missouri woman was awarded $5.2 million. Hold on. In a settlement from insurance company Geico after contracting a sexually transmitted disease from her partner in his vehicle, which was insured by the company. The Missouri Court of Appeals upheld the award this week. Okay. Now, I'm all about a payout. I'm all about, I think the insurance companies will do everything they can to never pay you, so I'm always rooting against them at the end of the day right. because I don't think they do the right thing. I know for a fact because I have a relative who works for one that you would know, I won't say, but he <laughs> told me that like they have classes to teach you how to deny claims. Oh. Yeah. That's not nice. No, and they make you keep fighting and fighting. Anyway, but I do like the lizard. I like their commercials. I hate the, um, what's the one with mayhem? Progressive. Yeah. Those are creepy, mean, not happy. No. no. no I don't like that either. You're threatening me. Right. I'm not buying something because I'm threatened. <laughs> no. You're just threatening me. But if I don't buy progressive, mayhem's going to ensue, and he's evil, and I don't like, I don't like the tone. <laughs> Thanks. I know, I'd be the old lady. I'd be the old lady at the polling thing when they show you the commercials for a test group. <laughs> I don't like the tone. I don't like the tone. The woman, a Jackson County resident, says she contracted HPV um, from her partner. Uh, in February 2021, the woman, anonymously identified in documents, submitted a petition to Geico correctly. She alleged that her sexual partner neglected negligently caused or contributed to cause to be infected with HPV by not taking proper precautions and neglecting to inform him or her of this disclosed diagnosis. She made a final settlement. She made a final settlement offer of $1 million to resolve her claims in, Oh, she was only going to take a million, but Geico refute denied the coverage and refused her settlement. The case was then sent to an arbitrator. The arbitrator determined that there was sexual activity in the insured's automobile. So they had sex in the guy's car. She got an STD that directly caused or directly contributed to the woman being infected with HPV despite her former partner's knowledge of his positive HPV diagnosis. Yeah, but where does this stop? Like, what if that was in his house? Do you get to sue the homeowner's insurance? Or what about a boat? It kind of does. Um, they said that the $5.2 million would fairly compensate the woman for damages and injuries. Mm-hmm. This is crazy. <laughs> A three-part panel responsible for reviewing the da, 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 upheld it. At the time of GEICO's intervention, liability and damages have been determined by an arbitrator and confirmed by the trial court. GEICO had no right to relegate those issues. The panel wrote that Geico could have defended its interest by entering a defense of the insured individual. Geico did not take advantage of this attorney, instead denied coverage and refused to defend insured. <laughs> yes. I, wow. I, I've never heard of something so crazy. No, it's ridiculous. Five million. <laughs> and why would, did, I think Geico thought, oh, she won't do nothing about all this. No. Yeah. Okay. I told you I'd tell you what the safest countries in the world are. Are you ready? Yep. We're going to go from 10 to 1. Okay. Um, and it's just based on crime and all the regular things you would think. Okay. Number 10, the safest, safest 10th place in the world to visit? Canada. 10th? Your 10th, Paddles. Why? There's uh, people, there's safer places. I say blame Toronto. <laughs> That's what I would do. Blame Montreal. <laughs> blame Montreal. Despite being larger than its neighbor to the <laughs> south, Canada ranks much higher than the United States. The country did report a staggering increase in hate crimes, especially towards Asians, and its economy took a dip during the pandemic, but its score actually improved overall compared to last year, thanks to lower incarceration rates and a drop in Western weapons exports per capita. Number nine safest country in the world, the Czech Republic. Yeah, they scored low in... Uh, they scored big in terms of low crime rates, low military spending, and low terrorism. Even pickpo pickpocketing is in a huge issue, issue and problems in uh, cities such as Prague, making this a very viably safe place to visit. All my Irish cousins love Prague. I've never oh, been, awesome. but that's where all the children, oh, they love sweet. it. And apparently it's cheap. Number eight, Ireland. I always feel safe in Ireland. Oh, yeah, um, they jumped three spots despite some violent anti-lockdown demonstrations. 
relatively low crime rates, good economy, and happy and friendly residents. <laughs> More than made up for the blip. Number seven, Switzerland. They don't even really give Switzerland a description. They don't even really get their, they give them scores, but. Number five, Slovenia. Slovenia. Who knew? How weird. Yeah, wouldn't Melania be proud? Mm-hmm. Four, Portugal. Lewis loves Portugal. Yeah. My sister and brother-in-law went. They loved it too. Oh, Never been. Mm-hmm. Six, Austria. I would not expect that. No. I would think Austria would have some high crime in the bigger cities. They get high marks for a sound business environment and good relations with its neighbors. Hmm. Number three, Denmark. Yeah, still have never been there. I want to go. The main source of con- conflict of whether it's better to summer on the northern coast or soak up some, um, I don't know, whatever. Okay. Number two, New Zealand. Huh. Well, there's nobody there. There's no people. Right. No. I've always wanted to go, though. I went to Australia for a Comedy Central deal, uh-huh. and then one of my brothers moved over there for work, but I never got a chance. I didn't have time. Number one, and I still want to go here too, safest place in the world. I don't really think they should get number one. I think you got to base this on people. Number one is Iceland. Come on. Well, yeah. come no. on. Nope. It's the most peaceful country in the region and world. A position it has held since the inception of its index in 2008. The Nordic nation has some of the lowest military spending. Who's going to attack them? Well, I mean, I guess they could be a big bridge in an international war type. Like, if you need them as a base to get your shit halfway across the ocean. Lowest international conflict rates in the world, and its incarceration rate, only 33 people out of a hundred per 100,000 are in jail. It's too cold to go hurt people. (laughs) (laughs) Or steal things. Hey, you want to go steal? That car's out there. It's got the keys in it. Nope, it's yeah. too cold. No. The heat's not on. I'm going to save this one. I'm going to save this one. Oh, I love this one. I love this. Two more. And then we're out of here. Okay, so GameStop, the stores, they're in the strip malls. I've only been in one. Well, I've been in two. One was an accident. I thought I was going in to get a pedicure. What? <laughs> it was in a strip mall. I couldn't tell which door was door, and I was just texting, and I don't know. I just walked in and went, oh, <laughs> shit. I thought I was getting a pedicure. And then I had to go in to buy one of my nephews something. Uh, it's, boy, there's nothing in there, I understand. But there's millions of these stores, GameStops, right? Mm-hmm. We regret to inform you that we all quit. Oh. <laughs> the children are quitting. Why? Because <laughs> they don't get it either. These GameStop workers aren't playing any games. A Nebraska star of the video game chain was forced to close after four employees walked out claiming bad working conditions. The foursome left a nefarious note at the Gateway Mall in Lincoln for his customers, informing them of the termination of their employment. Gateway Mall. <laughs> in Lincoln. The memo was taped to the store's window, and it said, we regret to inform you that we all quit. Our district manager has no respect for us as employees or human beings. Oh my God. <laughs> we have been told by our district manager that we're supposed to have had this store achieving sales quotas and running perfectly months ago, which was months before a lot of us even got hired. Unfortunately, despite the staff's best effort, we are not God. They're right. They're right, though. Spend your money at this establishment. Spend your money in an establishment that respects its employees, the statement added. (laughs) Former store manager Frank Martyr further elaborated on the walkout. For my health, I had to leave. So here's the big Frank. Martyr also claimed that he was expected to reach almost impossible sales goals while being paid a low wage. He alleged that his district manager was reportedly abusive towards him, and Martyr didn't receive proper store trading. Game Stop had another slew of employees quit in Lincoln earlier this year. Um, another store under the same district manager shuttered his doors after a walkout. Well, maybe the district manager needs to be fired. Maybe the kids are right. GameStop had a meteoric rise in popularity thanks to Redditors who pushed the stock. Oh, right. They did that, they did that crazy shit with the stock on that and helped raise the company's value in sales. The highest stock price for GameStop was $483. They had that. But with any rise comes a fall as the brand stocks have plummeted. Yeah, that was another Ponzi deal. Like, we're all just going to do this thing and then get out when you think, well, are we at the top? Right. You think so? <laughs> all right. I promised I, I would promise I would do this last week. It's so stupid, but isn't now you'll think about it. Who loves donuts? I love donuts. Yeah. More than bagels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was surprised in, um, in L.A. There's a, they, I would think California wouldn't. I think they'd be healthier. But 
when I lived in LA, there are a shit ton of donut stores. Like an inordinate amount in a great way. Uh All individually owned. Good ones? Very good. Yeah, nope. No, they passed it. They're not healthy donuts. They're bad, old school bad donuts. Mm-hmm. Nice. Chocolate long john, cinnamon bear claws, oh, the whole the thing. Best. Glaze. Mm-hmm. Here's the man who invented the donut. <laughs> a guy from Maine, a Maine mariner, Captain Hanson Gregory, gave us the deep fried treat we know to let. Here's his delicious story. This is like a little Paul Harvey thing, who, by the way, I learned was from Kansas. Yeah. I thought he was from Missouri. I don't know what the connection is. I'll have to Google it. Maybe he went to a Missouri radio station. Does it matter? I don't know. <laughs> well, for Kansas people, exactly. you know, they, they'll take what they it. can get. They have an astronaut. I saw a sign. <laughs> um, the then future high seas heroes in a moment of deliciously divine inspiration as a teenage galley boy turned a poorly cooked blob of sailor's sustenance into the iconic ring shape and then deep fried the delicacy we know and love. His innovation changed around the people in the U.S. and around the world with how they would eat breakfast. Captain Gregory was bold and brave, brave and bright, enthused Texas author, author Pat Miller, who first heard of the culinary inventor amid a boat tour in Boston Harbor. She also chronicled his life. There's wow. a picture of him eating a donut, and it's hilarious because it looks like he's got like the Abraham Lincoln beard and the outfit, and he's kind of chubby. He's not fat, but mm-hmm. it's just perfect. He's holding a donut. His contribution to American culinary culture has long gone unrecognized, save for the epithet about on his humble gravestone in a small, isolated sailor cemetery in Quincy, Massachusetts, overlooking Boston Harbor, where he lived out his final years. It reads simply, Captain Hanson Gregory, recognized by the National Bakers Association as the inventor of the donut. That's awesome. Yep. It turns 70, 75 this year. Cool. Yep. In June. Yeah. yeah. It was, he did it in 1847. He died in 1921. There's a picture of his gravestone. Wow. It, there should be a much bigger deal made of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, write dough that was deep fried in cauldrons of lard had been served to sailors on the seas for centuries. Dutch cooks made notable versions called oily cakes. Pff, that's not a donut. No. No. It's not very appetizing. Um, yeah. He he did it when he was 15. That's awesome. Yeah. And it goes on and on. There's pictures that don't. So there you go. If you're in Quincy, Mass., you can go see the, the, the tombstone, gravesite, of the guy who invented the donut. Cool. All right, termites. It's hot out there. It's hot everywhere. My friend Dorfman was going up to South Bend because Bert Kreischer, you know Bert? Yeah. Bert's doing these outdoor shows. He's a comedian, for those of you who don't know that. Um, he's funny. I really like Bert. Um, and I like the people he's picked for his shows, like Dave Attell. Like, really funny people. It's great uh-huh. lineups. Um, but they're outdoors, and I Dorf, Dorf was going up to run one of those deals. And I was like, oh, well, you're going to South Bend. At least you're going north. It'll be cooler. Nope. It's 100 degrees there. Marquette. I mean, you're going all the way to the UP. Wow. And there's a heat dome that's suffocating all of us here in the middle. It's just going to keep moving, too. If you think you're safe wherever you're at. That's what I said. A lot of people my age buy a little house in the panhandle of Florida. I'm going north. Yeah. Minnesota, Canada, mm-hmm. maybe. Well, Minnesota's got a ton of lakes, and I like to fish, So and so does Canada. I don't know if I can buy something in Canada and just do that. I probably have to get special permission or something. Uh, you. you can help paddles uh, figure yeah. out how I can do that. Okay. Um. Anyway, so stay cool. <sighs> you know. You're I'm going to Vegas to the Mirage, which is one of my f- favorite gigs I do two or three times a year. And Ron White is retiring, and I would just like to say if anybody's out there that has anything to do with that, I would love to have all of his dates. <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, he's voluntarily quitting. It's not like I'm hoping for his demise. He gets a lot of good December weekends. I always get the hot ones. And then Ron's like, are you going to golf? No. It's 107. <laughs> well, not if you get up early. I'm all about getting up early. This lady was up at 4.45 all weekend. However, it's still 100 <laughs> at 9 o'clock, 7 o'clock, even if you tee off. No, I can't do it. And I'm too, I'm too fair-skinned for all that shit. Um, wow. But 100, 105, 107. Yeah. What are you going to do in Vegas? I'm going to just gamble my ass off. Really? And I'm going to gamble, Fun. and I'm going to gamble, and then I'm going to go find old-school Wheel of Fortune slot machines. Then I might go down and see my little friend Carrot Top, 
depending on how much time I have. Um, I have a couple friends meet me out there. That would be fun. Drink, gamble. Um, if it's not too horrible, really hot, this is a secret. I don't tell a lot of people. No, it's a travel tip. But for the termites, everybody should know this because nobody thinks about it. So if you're at the Mirage, which would say, let's say that's the left side of the street, across the street, there's a Margaritaville. Now, hold on. Don't judge. <laughs> the, but it's not a hotel or nothing. It's just a restaurant and a bar. But if you go up to the second floor, mm -hmm. there's an outdoor patio for just drinks. Right. But it's not like some rooftop bar bullshit. It's just like a service bar set up. And you can, but you can sit, and it's shady. They got uh, umbrellas and all that. And you can watch the whole strip go by. Everybody walk in, the cars. It's like a perfect, there's very few places outside in Vegas where you can sit and watch the strip. There's some down by my pal George Wallace. He loves Mona Amiga B or whatever at Paris. Like, but if you go past that, the Budweiser, the Budweiser there's one called the Budweiser something, but now I, I ain't walking that far. That's across from uh, Bellagio. It's across from Bellagio. And the Bellagio, you think it looks big on TV? Oh, Christ. <laughs> it's like if, like, if I do the Mirage, I know where I'm staying. They always put me, like, in the same room, and it's easy. It's right by the elevator. Easy. But if I do a corporate gig out there, and then they're like, okay, so we checked you in, and uh, do you need someone to take you to your room? I'm like, no, I can still read. I think I can do it. But after, like, 20,000 miles of trying to get to your room, yeah. people have no idea how big the Venetian can be, Caesars can be, Bellagio. But anyway... If it's not too crazy, crazy hot, mm -hmm. I will go with my friends across the street to Margaritaville. If it's open during COVID, it was closed. Like, they didn't have enough help to work up there. Right. And I'm like, how about I self-serve myself? Mm -hmm. How about you me give me a tip jar, and I'll put my money in for each beer I take? Hmm? <laughs> how about that? Or how about I buy a beer downstairs, and you let me take it up there? I'm not going to do What am I going to do that's bad? I'm just going to sit up there and stare at people. I want to watch people on the strip fall over of the heat exhaustion. Right. I want to watch people die in real time. Um, all right. That's it, termites. Be cool, termites. Be safe, termites. Um, be summer, termites. Yeah. It's even too hot to go on the boat. I hate to say that, but... How the pool? The pool. I, yeah. But I can't even go to the pool in Vegas. It's too hot. Yeah. There's a tiki bar down there that has misters. I'm good for about... One fish taco and one beer. And then I'm like, I love how everybody acts like it's not happening, too. Oh, it's just a dry hit. Is that, are you from the Midwest? Do you like that humidity? Yes, because at least I know I'm hot. I'm sweating out heat. I feel like I'm internally combusting. Spontaneous combustion can happen. The dry heat, I'm boiling from the inside. Uh, no, I'm boiling from the outside in. The, uh, the humidity, the sweat makes me feel like I'm reacting to it, which is normal. It's not normal to not react to 107. No, I agree. Yeah. So there you have it. That's just my that's my travel tip for Vegas. Great. That's it, termites. Are we ready? Night night.